Daily Show. Does it work? To support Andy Rice of William Shakespeare, because you're the sort of guy who could you could you could quote the sonnets, I'm sure, couldn't you, Andy Rice? I could do, Bruce, but I'd hate to embarrass uh, you and others who are not quite so Shakespearean. Absolutely, we we're honest. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> Andy Rice, take me through, please, this idea of the experience economy, the knowledge economy. Mr. Mercato is part of the the knowledge economy, and he's got Vodacom to give him some compensation for his. Please call me. But the experience economy is something a bit different. Well, it really underpins a brand that made lots of waves in this last week, which is the arrival of Starbucks, uh, which is absolutely the kind of archetypal brand that is uh, exploiting the experience economy. So if you go onto the Starbucks website, they have a little movie there, which is designed to show you what you can expect to find if you, quote, meet me at Starbucks. And here's what you can expect. And I'll have to stop halfway through because uh, there's simply too much. But you can expect new love, enduring love, respect, sharing, understanding, beginnings, tradition, reunions, new moves, collaborations, rivalries, surprises, big days, reconciliation, surprise parties, favorite songs, two generations, giggles, curiosity, goofing off, and more besides when all you really want is a coffee. That's like my house. <laughs> so that's, that's the, if you put that lot together, and you really did experience that if you met someone at Starbucks, and I think you would say, well, I had a bit of an experience today at Starbucks. And that's really how brands are increasingly obliged to differentiate themselves, because the old uh, uh, proposition that our coffee tastes nicer or is made from better ingredients or all those kind of rational promises are no longer working as differentiators. You have to go one step further. And the concept of the experience economy was coined by a management uh, author called uh, Joseph uh, Pine back in the late, very late 1990s. And he actually used coffee as a very good indicator of how we've evolved into an experience economy. So he says, if you go back to when it was a commodity, when it was the farmer growing coffee, and he simply sold bags by the uh, by the ton or kilo or whatever of beans, then he got a certain amount of money for it. But if he then uh, added value to those beans by perhaps grinding them and, and serving them as pre-ground coffee, then the, the value per kilo increased still further because they'd gone from being a commodity to being goods. Then if you go one step further and you start to actually serve the coffee ready-made in uh, the, a corner cafe, then that's a service. And again, the value and the, and the revenue per kilo of coffee increases still further until finally when even, even corner cafes are generic, you move into the kind of experience economy. And so you go from extracting commodities to making goods, to delivering services, and finally to staging experiences. And that's what the experience economy is all about. Now, it, it then creates a level of expectation, um, and it creates the risk of over-promise and under-delivering. Because when you're selling an experience in your corner coffee shop, that's one thing. You have control over the experience. Then you've got to... Uh, as, as Pavlo would teach us, you've then got to create a system around the experience. So uh, for a long time, Vida, for example, had a great experience. But my experience of the Vida experience in recent times is it's fallen a little bit flat. The Kalula.com experience got very tired. And if they told the same joke one more time, you were going to go and walk up the aisle before the aeroplane had parked and, and have words with the person sharing the corny joke that had been written. Those all part of this experience economy. They're, it's a very delicate balance to get it right, isn't it? Well, it's like showing the same movie over and over again, isn't it? I mean, um, Kalula is a good example. It, it actually was um, inspired to take that role by an airline in America called Southwest Airlines that was very similar. It was the, it was the role model for Kalula. But you've got to keep refreshing that yeah. theater, as you rightly say. If you're going to go in for experiences, theatrical-type experiences that – that uh, command all your senses to enjoy, then you, you can't just, and, and you want loyalty from your customers, so you want them to come back. You can't just give them the same old show time and time again. You've got to keep it fresh. So a brand like T Mobile, um, their experience uh, strategy was to do flash mobs. So they had the famous ones you've probably seen from, from Heathrow Airport or from Waterloo Station, these sudden explosions of choreographed activity in the middle of a public place, um, which everybody whips out their cell phones, start ta starts taking movies of what's going on in front of them and shares them with all of their social media uh, friends and, and followers.
others. And um, by keeping that fresh and making one flash mob uh, totally different to the next one, they're, they're succeeding in avoiding the trap that you've described so well. Yeah, I mean, where does Nando's fit in? Because we have an expectation of Nando's to deliver a cheeky message. But uh, again, there's a particular Nando's experience. Where does that fit into this experience economy? Well, I think the experience in, in terms of an experience economy has to happen as part of the consumption experience. So it's when you're actually there buying uh, and consuming the brand. And I think Nando's own distinctive personality happens everywhere, not just in the store. So I wouldn't think that they fall full square into the concept of an experience brand. Um, but, but others do. We spoke recently on, um, but does it work, about pop-up shops. Now, those are absolutely an experience because you're paying a substantial premium for something which has a product or a brand at its heart, but has very much more than that, very much more to offer in terms of, of uh, emotional value. Um, I can give you another, a very good example from some years ago. I was uh, approached by Audi uh, as a possible prospect for uh, some new Audi. I think it was the A6. And they very cleverly contacted me and said, which of the following restaurants have you never tried but want to? And one of them was a, a restaurant in Pretoria called Retrievo. And I'd always wanted to go there but couldn't justify schlepping out to Pretoria. So uh, what Audi did was say, we want to show you our clever new sat-nav a navigation system in our new A6. So tell us which restaurant you want to go to, and the, the vehicle will be delivered to your home with the destination, the Retrievo restaurant in Pretoria, preset into the sat nav. You just get in the car and do what it says, and you'll, you'll get there, and we'll pay for your meal as well. Now, that was a very clever wrapping up of a, a straightforward brand message of technology in an experience that literally grabbed all of my senses by the time the evening was over. Very clever, um, perhaps for South Africa, quite an early example of the experience economy at work. Yeah, if you'd had your wits about you, you would have said, I like the restaurant the Georges Sank in Paris. Well, sadly, um, they, <laughs> sadly they gave you a short list to choose from. So. <laughs> but but, but, they, but it, it, again, it's brilliant. And brands that get it right, get it right, and they repeat it, and they get it right consistently. And it's about walking in. It's, I suppose, about the, the McDonald's experience. Theoretically, if you walk into a McDonald's in Santon, it should be a very similar to the experience in the McDonald's in Lagos, the McDonald's in New York, the McDonald's in Moscow. Go. You you know that you are in a McDonald's. Yeah, that's brand consistency. It isn't necessarily uh, an experience, and I don't think that McDonald's. You, when you walk out of McDonald's, you're particularly overwhelmed by having been had all your senses assaulted. I think you. It's still quite a product centric um, a brand. That, but when, as you say, when brands get it right and when they they keep it fresh and, and they never fall back on repeating themselves. The benefits are substantial because it becomes um, all about talkability. Uh, people will certainly share their experiences with others. So word of mouth or online word of mouth will, will happen. Um, and brands are elevated in terms of prestige and in terms of reputation for innovation. And all of those things lead probably to a more robust Price elasticity model. In other words, people will pay more for their brands. But it wears. It, it go when it goes against you. It goes against you really quickly. If you're used to the particular brand experience, you're in that experience economy, and if they lose the plot, and they don't have anything to substantiate it, if the product isn't that much better than product B or C or D, when that experience goes, you lose the vibe. You lose the feel. Yeah. You lose, feel, you yeah. lose the feel good. I wonder if Virgin Atlantic is hitting that little wall because when they first launched, they had the most wonderful experiential additions to their brand proposition. But just the simple act of if you're flying upper class, being picked up at your house and being driven to the airport um, in comfort in some fancy limo, that that in itself was was major. But then their I'll, I'll take your were, word for it, Andy. I'll take your their word. lounges were different. Um, you know, they're, they're in flight with the massages and the stand up bar and things. I mean, they really did look at every point of, of collision between consumer and brand and say, how can we improve that? I get the sense that perhaps they've become a little more commoditized. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I haven't flown them for a while. But um, you're right. You've just got to – it requires energy. It requires persistence. It requires creativity to keep that experience fresh and talked about every time. Max in Newlands with a question for Andy. Hello, Max. Yeah, hi. I was just wondering about the extent to which one can actually deliver on the experience economy in a country like South Africa strikes me as a bit of a first world phenomenon for the most part. 
uh, because it does require high education levels, high skill levels, etc., etc. Just like to hear your thoughts. Well, Thanks, Max, I, I, um, I think you're right up to a point, um, but I, we've quoted a few examples already in the last few minutes that were South African, and and and, and we spoke about the um, uh, the ice cream parlour in Rosebank. Was it? Um, uh, Magnum, and we've spoken about um, the Audi example I quoted. It certainly works. I suppose the the difference is that it's it's quite a high budget expense, and you probably have to keep doing it so that people look out for it and want to be part of it. But no, I don't think that this is a, a country that cannot uh, uh, demonstrate the value of the experience economy. It's just that they may well, as you allude, uh, do it in certain market sectors better than others. But also, I mean, if, if, if you're not reinventing it, then you're going to run out of steam. And once you run out of steam, I think you've lost the plot. But uh, Andy Rice, thank you very much. But does it work? Of course it works. But you've got to keep it fresh.